Hello friends. I want to welcome you as you listen to this important series called Necessary Truths in Challenging Times. Today I will be teaching on the heart of the Father. Many of us have been hurt by our imperfect earthly fathers and as a result that memory has distorted our image of God as our Heavenly Father. This message was designed to help listeners like you discover deeper spiritual truths that will strengthen your relationship with your Heavenly Father and help you to navigate the challenging times in your life. You can find book and CD resources on our website at www.theriverministriesusa.org and more teaching videos can be viewed on our YouTube channel, Margie Florent TV. Thank you for investing your time to listen to this important message. Hello my friend, thank you for joining me again for our subject called Necessary Truths in Challenging Times. We're going to continue on the study of the heart of the Father, but before we do, I would like to pray. And we're going to enter into this session believing God that God is going to open up the eyes of your heart, give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, and that you will never be changed after this teaching, after hearing this teaching. So Father, we just come to you today in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father, that your word says that the entrance of your word brings light. I pray for the hearer right now. I pray the eyes of their understanding to be enlightened, that they would know what is the hope of their calling, that they would understand and, and comprehend the heart of the Father. And Father, I am believing that they will forever be changed. I am believing that the words that I speak will go forth like an arrow and pierce their hearts and cause their lives to be transformed and changed in Jesus' name. So we've again been talking about the heart of the Father. We've said that the Father provides salvation. We've said that the Father provides your material needs. And we said that the Father pays attention to you and hears you and is concerned about each and every part of your life. Number four, we're going to talk about how the Father loves you unconditionally for who you are and not for what you will become or who you think you need to be in order to be accepted by Him. We did touch on this a little bit. I just want to go into it by way of review. Your Father accepts you unconditionally, whether in your mindset you are perfect or not. It doesn't matter. The Father looks at you and He loves you unconditionally. I think that if we had fathers who wanted us to get perfect grades all the time and look perfect, or maybe you had a, may have had a father who uh, would go to your baseball games and if you didn't score and if you didn't play well, he'd be angry with you. Well, I've got good news for you today. Your Heavenly Father Himself loves you. Whether you score in a game or whether you don't score in a game. Whether you're perfect or whether you're not perfect. As a matter of fact, if you're not perfect like every other human being on the face of this earth, the Bible says that His strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. So that if we do have imperfections in our lives and areas in our lives that we may be dealing with or struggling with, what I would encourage you to do is run to the Father don't run away from Him. If you've got issues in your life and things that you're struggling with, don't be like Adam and Eve in the garden where they hid themselves from the presence of God. Go boldly to the throne of grace. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.16 that you can go boldly to the throne of grace and obtain grace in your time of need. And Jesus said that His grace is sufficient for you so when you are weak, then you are strong. So the Father Himself loves you. And if you have weaknesses in your life, I would just encourage you to run to Him and don't run away from Him. So oftentimes people run away from God and they think that God is mad at them and God's not going to help them. And because they're not perfect, God can't be there. Well, those are the times you need to run to Him and allow Him to work in your life. So the Father loves you unconditionally. And Jesus came to the earth and He introduced us to a Father who loves us the same 
as he loved his own son, Jesus. The Amplified Version of Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew and I approved of you as my chosen instrument. God, your Father, your Heavenly Father, exactly the way you are right now, loves you and he approves of you. That word approved means to accept, to have or express a favorable opinion of, to accept as, satisfact as satisfactory. So God has a favorable opinion of you, and that's what I love about my Heavenly Father. I don't have to be afraid of Him or run away from Him. If I've got issues in my life and you have issues in your life, we can go to Him and we can obtain mercy and grace in our time of need, and He can straighten those areas of your life out. Number five, your father is not mad at you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, to give you hope and a future. Another translation says, I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. So the thoughts that God thinks towards you are not angry thoughts. They're thoughts of peace. Insecurity says, well, you know, God is thinking bad of me. Well, your heavenly father is not thinking bad of you. I want to read a scripture out of the book of Psalms, Psalms 139. David was a man who was uh, uh, actually went down in Bible history as a man after God's own heart. And if you know anything about Bible history, we find that David was not a perfect man. He made a lot of mistakes. He committed a lot of sin. But ultimately, at the end of his life, his legacy was that he was a man who loved God deeply. And he was a man who, who sought after God. And a man who, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. And let's see what David said. He said, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. Isn't that good that God knows you and he knows everything about you? That's what I love about God. He knows everything about me. And the scripture goes on to say, And you know my sitting down and my rising up. You will understand my thoughts from afar. You comprehend my path and my lying down. And you are acquainted with all of my ways. And he still loves you unconditionally. And he's not mad at you. And it's okay that he, un that he knows about all of the things that you think. And all he's acquainted with all of your ways. Verse 4 says, For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. And David goes on to say, you know, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot contain it or attain it. So God loves you unconditionally and he's not mad at you. And the thoughts that he thinks towards you are thoughts of peace. He says, I understand and I hear your thoughts from afar. I'm acquainted with all of you and everything that you're about, and I still love you. The Bible says that God is love. At 1 Corinthians 13, if you look up the definition of love, and it's lengthy, but one of the things that love is, is that it's not easily provoked. So no matter what, God's thoughts towards you are thoughts of peace. So you can be at peace that God is not easily provoked, that he's not mad at you, and that there's nothing that you can do, basically, that it will be a surprise to him. He loves you unconditionally. Now, I'm going to give you another prayer that you can pray for yourself. In session three, we talked about the prayer of our eyes of our understanding being enlightened. I want to give you another prayer for you to pray for yourself that will help you to understand and comprehend the love that God has for you. Remember that we said that prayer opens up the door for God to work. And James 4, 2 says, we have not because we ask not. So I'm going to give you a prayer that you can pray for yourself that will help you in your understanding of God's unconditional love for you. 
It's found in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. It says here in verse 14, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you. Now I've prayed this prayer for you, but what I want you to begin to do is to begin to pray for yourself. Your prayers avail much or work just as much as my prayers for you work. God wants you to pray this prayer for yourself. So it says here that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. I want you to say, I pray, Father, that you would grant me, you would grant me according to the riches of your glory to be strengthened with might by your spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in my heart through faith instead of the your in the scripture. You could say my, that Christ may dwell in my heart through faith, that I, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and width and depth and height, and that I may know, Heavenly Father, the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, and that I would be filled with all the fullness of God. This is a prayer that you can pray for yourself. And as you pray this prayer for yourself, God will increase you in the revelation of who He is. And God is love. And as you increase in this revelation of the knowledge of God's love, 1 John 4, 18 says that perfect love will cast out, drive out fear. And therefore, you will have more confidence in his presence. I can't teach you on prayer until I know that you know who the Father is. As you, become, as you come to know and understand the love God has for you, you will have more confidence in his presence. So when you get before God and you seek to be intimate with him through secret prayer, you can go into the throne of God. And if you start hearing all kinds of condemning thoughts, well, you can know that's not my heavenly father speaking that to me. My heavenly father's not mad at me. Oh, he speaks thoughts of peace and not of evil. This, this isn't of God. This is the enemy. You see, the Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So he'll be the one to come in and try to distract you from your prayer time with God. He'll come in and he'll try to distract that intimacy with the Father. Right from the beginning, Satan was jealous of the relationship that Adam and Eve had with the Father. And so he came in and he, tried, and he, he, he was ultimately uh, killed, stealed, and destroyed the intimacy that Adam and Eve had with their Heavenly Father. But we said it before, we'll say it again. Through Jesus Christ, that relationship is restored. So pray this prayer for yourself. Pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened and pray that you would have a revelation of the love of God. Now, the scripture says that the, 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 the revelation of the love of God is so big and so wide and so deep, it, it, it's unsearchable. So you can go from what the Bible says from glory to glory to glory in the knowledge of the love of God. What does that mean? That means here a little, there a little. You'll understand God's love for you. You'll find him doing this for you and that for you, and you'll see God's love for you. So I encourage you to pray this prayer. So let's move on. Your father, number six, is always home. It says in the, uh, the U.S. Bureau of Census, who's minding the kids? This is actually from 1994. It says in this statistic, of children ages 5 to 14, 1.6 million return home to houses where there is no adult present. That's pretty staggering. And that was 1994. And... I can't imagine what the statistic is for today's children. And 
I don't know, that, that to me is, is, I remember coming home to an empty house and I remember feeling lonely and afraid at times. And I remember feeling like there was nobody there for me. Well, I've got good news for you today. Your Heavenly Father is always there for you and He is always home. Not only is, always, is He always home, He can't wait for you to get home. And He has some things for you and planned for you and in store for you that, that would be a surprise to you. And He is waiting for you to come home. We're going to read the story of a man. We call it in the church world the prodigal son. And it's the story of a man who left home, left his father's house, and he got into a lot of trouble. And we're going to see the heart of the Father in this scripture. So I pray the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. I pray that you would come to know and understand the love that God has for you as you hear this scripture. We're going to go ahead and begin reading at Luke chapter 15. This is the story of the prodigal son. Verse 11 says, and I'm going to read quite a few scripture, but I believe you'll enjoy the story. It says here, and a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. I'm done being part of this family, and I want out. That's paraphrased. But this is what the New King James says. Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And so the father divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal or wild living. So this son wanted all his goods, he wanted all of his inheritance, and he went to his father, and I'm sure he was probably a bit disrespectful, and he said, I want all of my goods, I want everything that's due me, and I'm going to go out and I'm going to live on my own, and I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And let's see what happens to this young man. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went out and he journeyed, and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and sent, he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And he would have gladly have filled his stomach with the pods of the swine that the swine were eating, and no one gave him anything. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? In other words, he spent all his money. He went through his entire inheritance. You know, he was away from home. And here he's eating food that people feed pigs. Now, that's not a good place to be. Let's see what happens. Verse 18. Basically, what I think happened is he came to his senses. And he said in verse 18, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. He said within himself, I can't live like this anymore. I can't be away from the father's house. But I got to tell you, I screwed up really bad. I made a lot of mistakes. I took my inheritance. I went and was hanging out with harlots and did all kinds of crazy things. But something on the inside of him had to have confidence in his father's love. He had to know that if he went back home, his father would have welcomed him home and accepted him and approved of him and loved him. I'm convinced of that. As a matter of fact, the Bible says when you train up a child in the way that they should go, when they're old, they won't depart from it. He had to have been trained in love. He had to know love. He had to understand provision. He had to understand that no matter what, his father loved him unconditionally. And in the event he would go home, his father would receive him. He says here, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. In other words, I'm, I want to come back. I want to come home. And I know that I won't be able to get everything that I had before, but if you would just make me one of your hired servants, then I would be happy. Let's see how the father responded. And as we think about how this father responded, let's think about how your heavenly father would respond to you if you left home, if you had sinned against heaven and earth, 
if you oh, may have done some things that you're not exactly proud of, let's see how this father responded in this scripture. And he arose and he came to his father. And when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and he kissed him. Isn't that beautiful? The father sees the son coming home and he saw him coming from afar. I have to believe that the father had to be thinking about his son and longing for his son to come home and missing his son. And he had to have been searching for his son and looking out for his son. Because the scripture says right here that while he was still a great way off, his father saw him. And was his father mad at him? Did his father say, oh, that's it. You spent all the money. You're a done deal. No. The Bible says he had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I'll tell you what. I could just see it in my, 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 my mind's eye or my own imagination. If that was my son coming home after being gone for a long time and not knowing where he was, if, my, if I saw my son coming from afar and, I, and he was coming home to my house, back into the warmth and into the love of my own home and his home, because my home is his home, it's still his inheritance, nothing's changed, my love for him hasn't changed, I am sure that I would have been one of those people that would have run up to him, jumped on him, and kissed him all over his face. And that's what this father did. His father ran, had compassion on him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I want you to notice that the son was repentive. The son knew that he did wrong. The son, you know, you know, let me tell you. You do something wrong, you know you did wrong. You don't need anybody telling you. You know in your own heart the difference between good and evil. Your own spirit will convict you of what's right and what's wrong. This son didn't need anybody beating him over the head and telling him how, quote, you know, wrong he was in his behavior. But the son said to his father, he said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He repented. He said, basically, I'm sorry. I messed up. But the father said to his servants, and I think the father was excited. It's not like the scripture even says that the father acknowledged what he said. Although we should confess our sins to our heavenly father, we need to do that. But in this scripture, what I'm trying to say is the father just didn't even acknowledge what he said in this instance. He, he just immediately decided, we need to celebrate. We've got to celebrate. The father said to his servants, bring out the best robe, put it on my son, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. And then he goes on to say, for this my son was dead, and now he's alive again, and he was lost, but now he's found, and they began to make merry. So the father was waiting for his son to come home. There is somebody that's listening to this. You may be like the prodigal son. God, your father is waiting for you to come home. And the Bible says that when you come home, it's in John 6, 37, when you come home, First, make a decision that you're going home. Secondly, start running to God. Don't run away from him. And your heavenly father sees the attitude of your heart and he sees you from afar. And he says, when you come home, I will in no wise cast you out. I am waiting for you to come home. I am your father and you deserve all the inheritance that's rightly do you. And we find in this scripture that they're having a party and that we're not going to get into all the, all the verses, but the older son is angry. He can't understand why his father isn't, you know, uh, just, you know, beating him up over the head and, and being angry at him. And, and basically what happened here in the scripture is the older son was jealous. And it says here in verse 
30, but as soon as his son of yours came, the son said, who has devoured all your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fattest calf for him. He was jealous. He was upset. He was like mad. Like, like what is this all about? And he said to him, son, you have always been with me and all that I have is yours. He said, it was, is it right that we should make, it is, it was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother who was dead is alive again. And he who was lost has come home. So they're all, they're back into, back right with the father's house and the son who was the prodigal and the son who was there all along, they're equal. And once the son came home, that's it. It's over. So your father is waiting for you to come home. Your father forgives and forgets. Let's look at Psalms 103. If you had a mother or a father who was, you do something wrong and your mother or your father kept bringing up all the things that you did over and over and over and over, this concept of the father may be new to you. As a matter of fact, as I was preparing for this session, I've sensed in my heart, or I felt in my heart, that this particular subject is, be, is being driven home for someone who is a woman, and maybe more than one, who you are in a battered and an abusive relationship. And God wants you to know that He is there for you, and that He loves you with an everlasting love, and there's, he's not the one beating you up and bringing up your past and, 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 and accusing you. Your father wants you to know that he is here for you. And no matter what, he forgives you. He forgets you. He's not the one that's bringing things up. Look here at Psalms 103, verse 10. It says here, verse 10, God has not dealt with us according to our sins. So he's not the one that's bringing things up to you. He forgives you and he forgets, nor punishes us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. Let me read to you out of the New Living Translation. Remember, your father forgives and forgets. What that means is his forgiveness for you cannot be measured. It says in the New Living Translation, he does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those that fear him is great as the height of heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are and he remembers that we are dust. The Webster's definition for punish is to impose a penalty on for a fault, offense, or violation to deal roughly or harshly, to inflict injury or retaliation. So the Father does not punish us for all of our sins. Webster's for the word removed is to change location, position, station, or residence, to remove by lifting or pushing aside or taking away, to dismiss or get rid of or eliminate. So let's put that all together. That's, that, that whole verse, I can read it to you like this. God, your Father, forgives and forgets. He's not the one bringing things up. He does not impose a penalty on for a fault, offense, or violation. He does not deal roughly or harshly with you or inflict injury or retaliates. Did we see that happen with the prodigal son? No. The prodigal son was embraced, loved, and the father gave him the ring and the robe and threw a party. Instead, because of his unfailing love, he has changed location of the sin, removed it by lifting, pushing aside, and by taking it away. He has dismissed and eliminated it. So as far as the east is from the west, that's how far your sins have been taken away from you. 
not to be remembered anymore. First John 1 9 says, if you confess your sins to your father, the scripture says he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. And what else? Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So if you've ever sinned against heaven, if you've ever left father's house, your father forgives and he forgets and he doesn't remember it anymore. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now, right now, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. What does that mean, condemnation? There is no more need to be condemned. When you confess your faults, you confess your sin to your heavenly father, he's not going to bring it up and throw it in your face. This is a very valid point when we talk about prayer. Because I've had times when I would go to pray if I had maybe gotten angry or did something that wasn't quite right, and we've all been there, done that. I would go into prayer, to the secret place of prayer, and, and already had confessed my sin or confessed the thing that I did to my father. And the next thing I know, here comes this, you know, condemnation. Here comes this guilt. And it's just bombarding me in my, in my mind and in my, my, my thought life. And I used to think that that was God bringing up my sin and telling me all about it until I learned what the Bible said. I learned a necessary truth. I learned that my father forgives me. And as far as the east is from the west, he does not remember what I did. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that will bring those things up. He's the one that will accuse you. It's not your father God. So Margie, what do I do when that happens? Let me just give you a little lesson in mental warfare. We've said this before and I'm going to say it again. Not all your thoughts are your thoughts. So when the thoughts come to your mind that are contrary to the scriptures, the Bible says cast them down. Don't take the thought. Ephesians 6 says quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Those thoughts come to your mind and they're like fiery darts. They're not coming from the Father. They're the fiery darts of the wicked. When they come, don't take the thought. When they come, cast them down. And if you have to, say in the name of Jesus, I command you, Satan, to get far from me. My heavenly Father has forgiven me. I am washed in the blood of Jesus. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. That word righteousness means right standing with God. And when you do that, and you get that revelation, and you understand it, you could go boldly to the throne of grace with confidence, knowing that your heavenly Father forgives and he forgets. And he's not the one bringing those things up. Isn't that good news? Number eight, your Father is completely reliable. This is one of my favorite. And he keeps his word. Now, we've all had parents that they would say one thing, and then they would do another, and they didn't keep your word. Well, your Heavenly Father, if He says something, He's going to do it. The Bible says in Numbers 23, 19, it says that God is not a man that He should lie, neither the Son of Man that He should repent. What He has spoken, He will make good. See, I think sometimes as parents... We lie to our children when we say to them, I'm going to do this, 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 and this for you, and then we don't follow through with our word. And what happens is, is our children begin to lose confidence in us. Well, God is not a man. And he said it right in the scripture. He says, I am not like a man. I am a perfect father. I am perfect, and I am your perfect father, and I am not like man. What I have spoken... I'm going to make good for you. I'm going to do exactly what I said. Jeremiah 1.12 says that the word of God that goes forth and it doesn't return void, but it'll produce and it'll accomplish in the thing whereunto it is sent. 
God said, I will hasten my word to perform it. So if God gives you his word about something and his word is found in the Bible, then he is going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. So your father, his word is reliable and he will keep his promises to you. And the Bible says, and all the promises of God are yes and amen. So if God said something, he is going to do it. And, and I love that about his character. Number nine, your father's counsel and advice can be trusted. You can go to him and ask for wisdom and direction in your decision making. The Bible says in James 1, 5, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Sometimes I'll say to my children and my godchildren when they're, when they're making decisions about certain things, I'm talking major decisions. I always say to them, pray to God. He will hear you. In your decision making, go to God first. Don't put your father on last on the list. Go to him first and say, Father, I lack wisdom and you're my father. And I know you hear me when I pray and I come to you today and I have this decision to make and I'm asking you to give me wisdom. James 1.5, I'm going to read it to you in the message. It says here, if you don't know what you're going to do, pray to your father. He loves to help. You'll get his help and won't be condescend to when you ask for it. In other words, God's not going to look at you and go, well, you know, I'm just looking down on you, you know. Ask boldly, believing without a second thought. So if you have need of some wisdom and you have some decisions that you have to make, you can go to your father and you can ask for wisdom. And his counsel and his advice can be trusted. Jeremiah 1.5 says that before God formed you in the womb, he knew you. And the beauty of that scripture is this. Before he formed you in the womb, he knew you. What does that mean? It means that God knows you. He knows you before you were even formed in your mother's womb. So what that means is, is that since he knows you, that means he knows everything about you. He knows about your personality. He knows about your likes. He knows about your dislikes. He knows the things he put in you. He knows the talents and the gifts and the callings that he's put within you. He has unlimited knowledge of who you are. So as a child of God, it's very important that we go right to him in all of our decision making. And his advice can be trusted. Let's go on. How much confidence can you have in your father? Well, my friend, Jesus trusted his father so much that he knew that God the Father would raise him from the dead. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40 says, and Jesus is saying this. So he knew his destiny. He knew where he was going. It says here, as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. How far can you trust the Father? Jesus is saying, I know that when I die on the cross, I am going to go into what the Bible says, into, the, into Hades. And I'm going to prove this to you in a minute. So Jesus knew that he, his Father was going, he was going to have to go to hell, but we also know that in Psalm 16, and we're going to read it, that his Father promises to help. Psalm 16. And I want you to think about this when you think about your own life. How much can you trust God? How far can you trust God? Well, Jesus trusted his Father so much. He says here, he says, verse 1, Preserve me, O God, for in you do I put my trust. And verse 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. He says, therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh will also rest in hope. And Jesus says, and this is a prophetic psalm speaking of Jesus, 
for you will not leave my soul in hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy. How far did Jesus trust his Father? He trusted his Father so much that he knew his Father was going to raise him up from the dead. That word Hades is the Greek word, the region of the departed spirits of the lost. When Jesus was crucified at the cross, the Bible says he became sin for us who knew no sin. He became sin for us who knew no sin. That means because of, of the Adam and Eve, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Jesus became that sin and our punishment was that we were supposed to go to hell. We were supposed to be eternally separated from the Father. But because Jesus took our place at the cross and then went down into Hades for three days and three nights, you and I don't have to do that. Now in that moment where Jesus said at the cross, and we've all heard on Easter especially the story, when Jesus said at the cross, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? That was the moment when Jesus was separated from his father God. He became sin who knew no sin. And the punishment for sin is death, spiritual death. And so Jesus went into the lower parts of the earth. He went into what the scriptures calls Hades. He was there for three days and three nights, but he trusted his father, God. He trusted that his father was going to reach down and pull him out. The Bible says, and I'm going to give you a scripture to prove it. Romans chapter six, verse four says, Christ was raised by the dead by the glory of the father. He trusted his father so much that he knew when he was separated from him three days and three nights and had to go to Hades to pay the penalty for sin for us, he had enough confidence in his father that he knew his father was going to raise him up out of there. Praise God. Let's trust God today like we've never trusted him before. Let's trust our Father and let's roll all of our cares, all of our concerns, once and for all over on our Father God. We can trust him with our lives. I would encourage you, my friend, take time to get to know your Heavenly Father. Take time to go into these scriptures and study them for yourself and pray the scriptures that I told you to pray. And the word of God will not return void, but you will begin to see a difference in your life. God bless you.